see, after that extraordinary, extraordinary introduction, I'm now tempted to gently slip out through that room. Because it's all about clearly going to be a desperate disappointment. And for those of you that don't recognize my somewhat chiseled features, yes, my name is Fergal John. Uh, I think it's fair that I start telling you about a man called James. James was the chairman of the Labour Party in Derry, the town I grew up in, but there was a Labour Party in Derry, the town I grew up in. James was also the branch secretary of his local union, the Electricians Union. Uh, James was also my dad. And I can still recall with absolute vivid clarity the day James showed me a beaten up old copy of the Morning Star. Well, on the front cover, he featured a very generic photograph of delegates leaving the TUC conference at Blackpool Winter Gardens in 1963. But like all good Irish patriarchal families, James actually wasn't the lead politician in my house. And he wasn't the one you had to be afraid of. That obligation and duty fell to mum. Because it was mum on the morning of the 7th of April 1969 demanded that James bundle the family into the family car, drive us all the way across to the other side of Ireland, for as a family we took part in the People's Democracy Civil Rights Demonstration marching between Belfast and Dublin protesting against injustices in Northern Ireland. Now if some of you are not aware of the history of that, when I was growing up in my town, there was the majority of people did not have the right to vote in local elections. The majority of people did not have access to a job and or housing. So as a 10-year-old boy, I suddenly find myself walking down to the middle of the main road between Belfast and Dublin, enthusiastically waving what I later discovered was an anarchist fly. <laughs> And I have to tell you, that's a really bad lesson for a ten-year-old. <laughs> and what that taught me was not to fear. And not to fear authority. And not to fear injustice. And that's a really, really bad thing for a ten-year-old to learn. I vividly recall a little while ago, there's a loose collection of environment organisations, community groups in Northern Ireland. And they get together and have an annual conference. And hugely flatteringly they invited me to travel back to my hometown Derry to give a keynote address to this conference. And as I explained to Mrs Sharkey, it was one of the bits of public performance I was most terrified about. Because these were friends of my parents. These were people I knew as a child. These were plumbers, electricians, school teachers, the unemployed, activists, non-activists. But there were this very self-same plumbers, electricians, bricklayers, the unemployed, activists, poets, who plotted to bring down the government to Northern Ireland, and they brought down the government to Northern Ireland. What the hell have I got to tell those people about lobbying, or politicking, or campaigning, or anything else? But as you might probably tell, as a child, I learned at the knee of the great. Which fast forward in about 50 years became a bit of an issue. See, I've always had this mad enthusiasm for standing in rivers waving bits of carbon fibre around my head <laughs> with tiny, tiny little flies tied to the end of it, trying to persuade some utterly magnificent trout or even a salmon that this thing that I'm pretending that I've actually made from bits of wool and bits of silk is a real life insight and lets you grab a hold of it. I'm the chairman of the oldest fly fishing club in the United Kingdom. Who ever thought that the guy from Derry would end up being chairman of the oldest fly fishing club in England? God only knows. But I am. There's only 60 of us. There only ever was 60. There will only ever be 60. We own two and a half miles of chalk stream in Hertfordshire. And about seven or eight years ago, we began to realize there was a massive issue with the water quality in the, in the river. We were losing the water, the flow wasn't there anymore, the quality of the water was dreadful. Now for those that don't know, Southern England is home to these remarkably brilliant, unique 
river habitats called Chalk Street. They only exist in England and a tiny bit of northern France. There are only about 225 of the entire planet, and 85% of them are found here in southern England. They really are as precious globally as the Amazonian rainforest. And we are destroying every single one of them. And in the case of the Elbow Magna Fishery, I'm not going to put this. Um, there's 60 men and women, and I say this with enormous love, but they are 60 men and women of a particular type, because you've got to become a member of the oldest fly fishing club in the United Kingdom, all of the United Kingdom, if not possibly the world. Or as I refer to them, they're normally ladies and gentlemen of a certain age, awkward, bloody-minded, cantankerous, and far too used to get their own way in life. <laughs> So when the nice lady from the environment agency told us there was nothing they could do. <laughs> now you've got 59 people standing behind me who are awkward, bloody-minded, cantankerous, far too used to get their own way in life going, you're the awkward, cantankerous Irishman that learned how to protest. You were the one standing in the middle of the road at 10 years old waving an anarchist flag. Fix this. So we took the environment agency to the high court. Well, actually... I was pretty much in my car, driving there when my phone rang. Now in terms of the Alpha Magna, we had two and a half miles of some of the rarest river system on the planet that was turning into two and a half mile long stagnant pond. The ecology had fallen off a cliff, the fish had disappeared, dead died off, the insects, the bugs, the wildlife, it had all disappeared because of the degradation and the collapse in the environment in the river. Now we got our thing fixed quite quickly. But those awkward, cantankerous, bloody minded people were always going to get their issue fixed quite quickly. The animal mind has existed for 182 years. Did the environment agency really think that was the first fight that the animal magnet fishery had to pick in 182 years? But here's the odd thing. That kind of made me curious as to why 60 old men and women who just want to go fishing had to take the Environment Agency to the High Court. And that gave me an itch. And stupidly, naively, much to my frustration at this point, I bloody will scratch that itch. <laughs> and now I've discovered four years later that every time I scratch that itch, I just end up with a bigger bloody itch. As we speak, some of the rarest river systems on the planet are now, according to the Environment Agency, being over-abstracted to the tune of about 1.2 billion litres of water per day. That includes southern water. Because guess what? Off of those chalk streams, scared to run the bottom part of the coast, from Hampshire all the way into Sussex, and sweep right around the coast. I also discovered the water companies because of the failure of regulation and the failure of political oversight, have gained the system totally and entirely to their advantage. As we speak, water companies have now paid out 72 billion pounds in dividends to their shareholders, and in return, every single river in England is polluted. There is not a single river in England that meets good overall health, and one of the largest sources of that pollution is the water industry, and particularly from sewage. And as the good people of Medway, Thanet, and indeed right around the Kent coast, all the way down into Southampton, are now familiar with, on an agonizing routine basis, as soon as there's a drop of rain, southern water will start dumping sewage in and onto our beaches and into local rivers. But here's the curious bit. This is a company that just over a year ago was fined 90 million pounds for illegally dumping copious amounts of sewage all around the southern coast of England. And here we are 12 months after and they still slightest hint of rain and suddenly it appears that there's sewage alerts going off right along the south coast. The impact, as you all know, environmentally is immense. 
repeat it, there is not a single leader anywhere in England that meets good overall environmental health, and one of the primary justifications for that is sewage pollution by the water industry. That you guys already know. Anybody went for a swing the second week of August this year, in the middle of the school holidays? 50 beaches along the south coast of England were closed and were running sewage alerts because of sewage pollution the second week of the school holidays at the height of the tourist season. So not only are they now fleecing us as water bill payers, that's 73 billion pounds, every single brass penny of that came out of our pockets. That's funded off your water bills. So not only are they doing that, they're not impacted on wider society. You can't go to the beach. If you run a business, if you can hire a shop, you want to rent surfboards, you want to rent bicycles. I'm not particularly keen on going surfing on a big pile of sewage. As the good people of Cornwall have discovered this very weekend, down in St. Agnes. The truth is, what you're experiencing, what you're looking at, is nothing more than the physical manifestation of 30 years of failure of political oversight, 30 years of a regulatory system that has proved itself utterly incapable of properly overseeing the activities and the impact of the water companies, and 30 years of the water companies profiteering at our expense, or as the FT has recently referred to it, nothing more than an organized ripoff. My name is Fergal Sharkey, may you God go with you. Mm-hmm.